SSD in the lower end models have that art $2,350 model moves up to a Samsung SSD drive 512 gigs in capacity so that's nice plenty of room usually with SSDs you're, you're facing oh do I want space storage space or do I want speed well you get it both with this one 16 gigs of RAM and guess what boys and girls inside we have two RAM slots so you can actually upgrade RAM unlike other thin and light laptops where things are soldered on very easy to get to and we'll show you what the internals look like just right now. So you just saw inside there were two fans inside, two RAM slots, there's a socketed wireless card so pretty easy to upgrade. So those of you are saying well you know MacBook Pro 15 inch with Retina display or this I don't know I mostly want to run Windows. Well here's something that this actually has in its favor against the Mac. You can actually easily upgrade the internals. You've got your MSATA SSD drive, your upgradable RAM, your socketed wireless card. It's not hard to open this. You just flip it over and just like the other XPS's, nifty carbon fiber bottom. Who doesn't like a carbon fiber bum? I do. Anyway, a lot of Torx T5 screws here. Well, not too, too many, but around the edges there you'll find them all. And then when you lift up the service tag cover right here, two Phillips head screws. Unscrew those, work off the cover from the front edge, and you can just get the cover off and to get to the insides like you saw. Ventilation here, obviously, and like other XPSs we've looked at, we have the little rubber feet here so it doesn't go skittering across the desk on you. It raises up just a little bit here to give some room for the ventilation. More vents over here. And if we take a look at the ports, really it's pretty amazing how this looks pretty much like the XPS 13 reviewed, only larger. And of course, you're going to get more por ports here. That's the advantage of a bigger machine. And that's where our power brick goes in. And this is full size HDMI, mini display port, so you can drive monitors higher than full HD resolution. USB ports, we have four total. These two here are high-speed USB 3. Dell does not color code those. They just really want to make you to memorize which ones are and are not. There's your combo headphone mic 3.5 millimeter jack and a little button that can tell you how much charge you have left in your battery. Another standard thing on the Dell XPS line. Flip it over on the other side. And we have SD card slot. Yay! USB 3.0 super speed symbol right there and this is a USB 2.0 port that one has charging so that's what I mean you have to remember that this one is the 2.0 port why they don't have all 3.0 ports I really don't know but uh, there are some legacy USB peripherals that sometimes don't behave well on 3.0 so I suppose that could be a handy thing and we have our lock slot over here good looking machine again just like all the rest of the XPS line we got the contrasting metal over here with the carbon fiber wrap tapers a little bit to the front and the lid is the basic Dell lozenge and here just for size comparison and you can see the uniformity of the look of the line Dell it really does have a, a monolithic look for the XPS line this is the Dell XPS 13 right here so now the XPS 13 is pretty small for a 13 inch ultrabook it's more like the size of a 12 inch so that can skew your sensibility a little bit there but you get the difference between our 15.6 inch XPS 15 and the XPS 13. And now we have the 15 inch MacBook Pro with Retina display sitting on top. Both very thin, both weigh around the same 4.4 pounds. And there's going to be a slight difference in the dimensions in part because of different aspect ratio. Apple uses 16 by 10 versus 16 by 9 for Windows machines, but you get the idea. Pretty similar footprint, pretty similar weight. Now I'm lifting up almost 9 pounds. There we go. So given the wider screen, the Dell is going to be a little bit wider. Otherwise, you get two classy looking metal notebooks here. Of course, the Mac is metal all around, no carbon fiber on the bottom, just strictly metal. So taking a look inside, this is where the look really diverges from the Mac because we have this soft touch black interior that Dell uses on the XPS line. Feels really nice. I like this a whole lot. Nice big synaptics trackpad over here, backlit keyboard, all done in black. And I, I like Dell keyboards a lot. I think you know that for the XPS line. Just very tactile, nice shaped keys. They're right up there with Lenovo ThinkPad for really enjoyable typing experience. Now the keyboard, I'm, you know, they maybe could have stretched this out a little bit. There's a lot of room around on the sides over here. Maybe added a number pad, but they, they chose to stick with this basic design. Everything is pretty normal. We have our arrow pad over here. Smaller keys than the others, but still nice and separated, easy to use. 
Multimedia controls up here. You do not need to hit the FN key for us to activate those. Just a very nice keyboard. Trackpad is always on Dell's one. It's responsive. It's good. The Synaptics trackpads have been good. Multi-touch gestures, single touch. It's the usual buttonless design. And there's what it looks like from the side. So you can see the key relief. The keyboard is sunk in a little bit in a tray here. So it's a little hard to tell the actual relief because it's dropped down. But give you an idea. The soft touch finish does pick up some fingerprint oil. So does the carbon fiber bottom. Obviously the lid does not. Power button is right over here, and that's pretty much it for your controls and input. So how about the screen? That's a pretty exciting feature of this laptop. 3200 by 1800 resolution. Now we've seen that in a couple of Ultrabooks so far. The Samsung Ative Book 9 Plus, the Lenovo Yoga 2 Pro. So this time it's stretched out to 15.6 inches. And you can see it's glossy. There's some glare there, but viewing angles are quite wide on this, IPS-like. But it will pick up some glare. So for those who are wondering how that resolution would be on 15.6 inches being bigger, here we have the Windows desktop running at 3200 by 1800, 100% scaling. That means no upscaling whatsoever to make things any bigger. Uh, would you call that usable? Well, maybe if you eat a lot of carrots and you have really awesome eyes, but uh, these are pretty small icons here. So you're probably not going to want to run at 100%, but I know that some of you like to see how it actually looks. So let's launch IE. Now, IE scaling is turned on right now, so other than the UI elements around it, things are going to look a little bit bigger. But here's our teeny tiny little controls right here for internet options. And the zoom is currently set to 200%, so what happens if we choose 100%? So there we have 100% scaling. You don't want to do this, folks. You really don't. Thank God Windows DPI scaling exists. But that does lend it. The usual discussion with Windows is that not all applications support Windows DPI scaling, particularly Adobe CS Suite. That means Photoshop, Elements, Lightroom, all that kind of thing. So you're going to get small menus there. It's not going to be as tiny as this is right here, but it's going to be a little smaller than you like. So we're going to put everything back to it. Normalsville so you can see the rest of the video with something you can actually view. And now for something you can actually see, this is the machine with DPI scaling turned on set up to 200%. That's how it ships. It's pretty darn readable. Everything is big enough to be touched. You can even go a little bit smaller if you wanted, and I think it would still be fine. But this is something that most everybody would visually find appealing. Of course, the Metro side of things, everything is always viewable because that handles scaling well. So how about display color gamut? Very good on this, right up there with the top Ultrabooks. And this, again, is a sharp panel, 97% of sRGB. So good stuff there. And we have 78% of Adobe RGB. So that is a very healthy color gamut by laptop standards. This is quite a nice panel. Now, one thing we did was turn off splendid color. If you go into Windows Mobility Center, you'll notice under display, there's an option. Dell has that turned on by default. And that kind of skews color saturation. The, the, the reds are kind of like overdone and some other colors are un, not so well represented. So to get a pretty good Delta E here to get very good color reproduction, turn that off for those of you who are graphics professionals and care about such things. The display can reach 450 nits of brightness. If you have auto brightness turned on, you're in a really bright location, you'll see it get that bright. That's kind of retina burning, ouchy, very bright. After color calibrating and having auto brightness turned off, we saw 384 nits of brightness, which is still very bright. Now, color calibration can affect brightness because it's changing the amount of red, green, and blue that you're seeing. So that's how that works there. Anyway, overall, a very beautiful display. As to the resolution, it really depends on what you're working with. If you're doing Photoshop and you're working with high-resolution images, I think most people are willing to put up with the tiny menus until Adobe finally gets their act together and starts respecting DPI scaling, because you're going to see a whole lot more on screen. Likewise, if you're working with higher resolution and higher than HD video content, you're going to appreciate having more resolution on screen. Other than that, not so much. When you're playing games, what I do is I set the resolution of the display to 1920 by 1080 before I even play games because this is not a top of the line Alienware. You're not going to be playing resolutions above full HD on this on today's demanding 3D games anyway.
Now, in terms of benchmark performance, again, this is a very fast machine. This is a quad core. This is, you could call it a desktop replacement, except for it's 15 inches thin and 4.4 pounds. So it's not one of those big, heavy eight pound bricks that you might want to carry around, but it has a lot of the same qualities for the internals. First off, for that Samsung PM841 SSD, here's our crystal disk mark results, always very healthy. Yeah, it's not PCIe like the 15-inch the Retina Mac, but you know what? Those drives are hard to find aftermarket. I'm okay with MSATA. This is plenty fast enough. On other synthetic benchmarks, 3D Mark 11, it scored P2991. That's the performance mode test. Now, that's not a super high number. I mean, we did the ASUS Republic of Gamer G750, which has the same graphics card in there, and it scored considerably higher. So there's going to be some thermal throttling that goes on on a chassis this small. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. PC Mark 7, really not the greatest benchmark to give you a sense of complete performance anymore because it looks at SSD and all that kind of thing, and you'll have something that's way, way faster than Ultrabook like this score only a 1,000 points more. But anyway, it scored 58.05. W prime it computed pi in 9.74 seconds which is well about one third the time that it would take a core i5 ultrabook to compute pi so that gives you an idea of the computational prowess that this has geekbench 3 3194 for single core multi core 11493 so about twice as fast there compared to a Core i5 Ultrabook. So for those of you who are doing demanding tasks, you're compiling code a lot, and we're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, people who are doing some CAD work, if you're doing some 3D modeling, if, if you're even into HD video editing, this is a good machine. I know some of you try to cram that into a dual-core Ultrabook, and, and it's just going to be a bit laggy and slow. So this machine has the horsepower. So how about the whole thermal throttling thing? The last generation of XPS 15 we looked at, we had great issues with the CPU doing a lot of throttling because see, really skinny chassis, not a whole lot of room for heat dissipation over here. Well, Dell has a good two fan design inside and happily we did not see CPU throttling even when running at it, doing some pretty challenging tasks, no problem there. In the GPU department with the NVIDIA dedicated graphics, and by the way, you get to use the regular stock NVIDIA software. There's no customized Dell drivers, so you don't have to wait for them forever to update their drivers separately. You can just download the latest NVIDIA drivers always for this. But anyway, we did see some graphics throttling there. I'd say the 3D Mark 11 results show that. And it, this is not a gaming laptop. It doesn't have room for that much cooling for big fans. Battery life is something that Dell cared about for this, so... Yeah, you can play Crisis 3. In fact, we're going to show you how it plays Crisis 3. And it's not too bad, but it's not a killer gaming laptop. But for somebody who just wants occasional real 3D games on this, I don't mean playing Plants vs. Zombies, I mean Crisis 3, it can do that. And happily, the fans are not too noisy either. Now, I play games like that plugged in so that we don't see any power management getting in the way of how the game performs. And honestly... You'll, you'll hear the fan. You hear the fan with any laptop, particularly thinner ones. It's not egregious. Good enough. So how about battery life, since we were just talking about that? Well, we have the larger battery in this model. Again, if you get the top-of-the-line model, you get the 91-watt-hour battery versus 61-watt-hour. So basing that on the larger battery, obviously, battery life has been surprisingly good. Again, for something that you can feasibly call a desktop replacement, about six and a half hours with moderate use. Now, if you're doing really heavy things like, say, rendering video, expect more like five, four and a half, five, something like that. But for productivity use, Word, Excel, email, web, playing, streaming video, that kind of thing, six and a half hours, which is pretty good for a machine that is this powerful. And this is what the included charger looks like. I, again, it's pretty typical of the XPS line. They just get bigger as the laptop gets bigger. And this is a 130-watt charger. So it has enough juice to power up the CPU and the GPU. You don't have to worry about not getting enough power to actually run those at maximum performance levels. Other amenities include Gorilla Glass NBT on the display. So a little scratch and crack resistant there. Wi-Fi is Intel 80211 B, G, N, N, A, C. That's a 7260 dual band card. That's currently the best card you can get on the wireless market and that has integrated Bluetooth 4.0 as well. There is no WAN option on this 3G, 4G right now, but you can always use your cell phone or a MiFi as a hotspot for the laptop. Now, just to show you uh, how applications do or don't respect scaling, for example, here's Origin right here. For those of you who use Origin, you know 
well, it usually looks a lot bigger than that. This is kind of teeny, and you can see that our display is, is currently set to 3200 by 1800 right there, and we have our 200% DPI scaling turned on, so Origin is ignoring that. Games in general don't always handle the scaling really well, so I find just, if you want to play games, set it to 1920 by 1080 and just 100% for the scaling, and that's what we're going to do before we demo the game for you, so we don't end up with strange letterboxing or other bizarre behaviors or unnecessary degradation in performance. All right, here we are, 1920 by 1080 resolution, 100% for the scaling. Things are a lot more viewable here in beautiful, wonderful Origin, aren't they? So we're going to try out Crisis 3. All right, so let's take a look at our settings. And by the way, listen to those speakers. Very nice stereo speakers. We're at 60% system volume right now. Loud, obviously, too. Here's our graphic settings. So we're going kind of low settings for most things. Texture is medium. And our aliasing set to low. He wanted to start out at for medium and everything. And I, I really, I like to play this closer to the upper 30s at least for frame rate. So I changed it. Everything is low here except for post processing. And let's see if we drop that to low. Drop that to low. Alright, you can see our frame rate on the upper corner here. Mostly upper 30s. Frame rates are holding just fine. Let's go. dropping to lower 30s. So that gives you an idea of what it's like in terms of frame rate. We're not going to run through a this is not a game demo here, but you can see that it, it's quite capable. Listen to the fan. Yes, you can hear it. No, it's not obnoxious. While we're talking about noise, that brings to mind coil wine. Those of you who have watched our XPS 13 most recent edition review know that we mentioned the fact that sometimes you hear a kind of like a mosquito, not right next to your ear, but a mosquito who happens to be living underneath your keyboard. And it comes and it goes. It's a pretty weird thing. Now, it seemed like it was from the keyboard lighting on the XPS 13. This one, whether the keyboard lighting is on or off, doesn't matter. It happens a little bit more often maybe when the machine is plugged into power rather than unplugged. Honestly, the fan, even at a low wear, not the way it's going right now because we were just playing a game, will drown it out. But those of you who are particularly sensitive to high frequency sounds may be bothered by the very faint, but you can hear it when it comes on. Eee! So that's the Dell XPS 15. Really, there are a few products like it on the market. If you're looking for a quad core power, some dedicated graphics, mid level, mid range dedicated graphics right there, 4.4 pounds, slim, good looking design, high quality. Uh, there's not much like it. And happily, really, with the fourth iteration, Dell has gotten it pretty well right. Other than seeing some occasional graphics throttling, mostly when playing games really punishing it hard, and a reboot will take care of that when that happens, it's a pretty flawless machine overall. Again, for those of you who are susceptible to the high pitch sound, may be bothered by the coil wine that may come, may go. Some units seem to have it more than others. I have really good hearing. It hasn't bothered me. You could be different on that. But in terms of power, build, materials, the fact that you've got two RAM slots inside, MSATA SSD, that's pretty easy to upgrade, so I'll take that any day. Good machine, great keyboard, backlighting on there, resolution option to go up to QHD plus resolution if you want to, and then there's a 1920 by 1080. Speaking of pricing, the base model, again, 1600 that gets you the full HD display, not the super high resolution display inside, gets you the 61 watt hour battery. Spitting conventional hard drive inside 8 gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of RAM. Still a spinning hard drive inside with a caching SSD, but going up to the high resolution display, that's going to hit you about 2000 And our really tricked out model here is 2350 So you're going to pay for what you're getting right here. This is not cheap. This is not bargain bin. But again, other than the 15-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display, there's really not much like it. Asus was doing some pretty nice 15-inch uh, 
shall we call them ultra portables that had some power, but they really haven't been refreshing. We're still back at the last generation Ivy Bridge, so there you have it. So that's the Dell XPS 15, latest edition as of 2014, April. And it really, it's a pretty easy machine to recommend. There aren't many like it out there. If you need something that's powerful but thin and light, this is it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full review. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.